My main text is Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, verses 33 to 44. Mark 6, 33, actually to 43. And that is the well-known account of uh, Jesus when he uh, fed the multitudes, the 5,000 men, and obviously besides women and children uh, as well. And, uh, but let us start with the text this morning. I'm reading from the New King James Version, Mark 6, verses 33 to 43. But the multitudes saw them departing, that was Jesus and his disciples, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. And they arrived before them and came together to him. Verse 34 says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them. Because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd, so he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Verse 37, but Jesus, or he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? Uh, but he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in ranks, in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments of the fish. May the Lord open up the eyes of our understanding and bless his word to you uh, today. Um, I've ministered on this passage many times, and uh, perhaps you have heard many different sermons on this well-known portion of Scripture, but I want to focus on a perhaps a little different or, or just one aspect uh, of this today and in terms of our personal mission. Uh, I've been speaking over the past few weeks on some of these strong foundations, the good foundations on which we need to build our lives to withstand trouble times and tribulations of which Jesus foretold, but he also gave us his word. He gave us an encouragement on how to stand strong through anything that comes our way. And so I trust that this word, and uh, last week I spoke how important it is to have a vision how important it is to have a purpose. And this week I want to speak about mission, and we know the Great Commission, but I'll come to that. But I want to focus on our mission in a personal sense this morning. And I've entitled the message, A Mission to Multiply. A Mission to Multiply. It's actually amazing. It's, if I can use a word that the Apostle Paul uses, is is exceedingly profound when we think of it and have a look at it that God's purpose, mission for man, the reason he created him and us today has never changed. Now the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, 27, I'm not going to go there, that God made us, he made men, he made man in his image. He made us in his likeness, and he made us to have dominion over all the earth and everything that he had made. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Have dominion over it. Now, we know the story in the Garden of Eden, how that, that purpose, um, that uh, for who we are created to be in the image of God was marred by sin. And we know later that God sent his son 
Jesus to die for our sin, again to restore that image and to restore that original purpose. And one of the very, very important things and what I want to focus on this morning is multiplication, that we are made to multiply. Maybe tell someone next to you this morning, you are made to multiply. You are made to multiply. And if there's no one next to you, bring someone next week and then you can tell them you are made to multiply. Fruitfulness. We know in John 15 that Jesus spoke about fruitfulness, how the Father looks for fruit as a husbandman. And we are the branches, he is the vine, but he looks for fruit, for more fruit, for much fruit, that we may glorify him. So that's where we are this morning. And I want to have a look in a way to go back to our original Mandate. Now, we know the well-known portion of Scripture when I'm talking about uh, going back and how God, in His grace, in His foreknowledge, is bringing us and takes us back to His original purpose for creating us. And then later on, I just want to, in a moment or two, to touch on some of the qualities from this passage this morning on how we can multiply or what are some of the essential things that we need to multiply. If you're joining us on the podcast this morning, I especially want to welcome you here today as well, bearing in mind that some are working and some are far away uh, also. So a warm welcome, and we trust that God is going to speak to your heart. I think we often quote the scripture, and sometimes you see it on car bumpers, that God works all things together for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I think sometimes... It is not a fully understood scripture, and sometimes we can uh, say, well, that that God is going to work for my Ferrari and my my big house and this and that. But the good that God is actually working for us goes right back to his original purpose, which he is busy restoring in us through Christ. Let me read it for you quickly. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. What is that purpose? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then the word carries on, moreover whom he predestined, he also called, and those he called he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So God has in Christ restored us to that original image and is still perfecting us as we continue to walk in him. I sent out a little clip yesterday, and I think from John Newton in a shortened form, where John Newton says, um, I'm not yet what I ought to be, uh, but I know that I'm also not what I used to be. I'm not yet what I ought to be, but I know that I'm also not what I used to be, and that is because Christ continues to perfect us and we are being conformed to the image of his Son. Um, in fact, sin means to fall, it, it means to miss a mark, and miss what mark? It means to fall short of the glory of God. And in Christ, God restores that glory which he has originally created us for, to have that dominion to multiply, to be fruitful, to replenish the earth, and then ultimately we know in the future dispensation is to rule and reign with Christ forevermore. But I've put over here what I want to touch on and to ask the question, how can we multiply? And I want to, us to think this morning in a broader sense, not only in a sense that is in Scripture, which I'll touch on in a moment But what are some of the essential qualities that we as children of God need to multiply? And I've given some key words over here. The first one is compassion. The second one is discipleship. And the third is faith. Number four is order. Number five is prayer. And the sixth one is servanthood. So we'll touch on these as we uh, go along this morning. The first thing we see... When the multitudes, now this was after that the disciples were sent out and and they were astounded that even the devils obeyed them and they were healing and they had sent out on their first mission, if you like. 
And, um, but yeah, they were confronted, and Jesus said, let us draw aside for a while. But when the multitudes saw where they had went, it says that they all gathered, people from all around. And it said, Jesus saw and lifted up his eyes and saw the multitudes and had compassion on them. If we want to multiply, if we want to be fruitful, personally, corporately, we have to have compassion. We have to have compassion. I like the word compassion. In the word compassion is the word passion. We know what the word passion means. It means to be zealous. It means to be excited for something. It means to, to, to go out with zeal and enthusiasm, doesn't it? But the word compassion is similar it is to actually have passion for others. It is actually to see those around us with passion. Doesn't the Bible say to us, do not look out only on your own things, but look out for the needs of others also. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Whether that be out there, having compassion, and sometimes we see uh, the wicked as problems. <laughs> uh, we see bad politicians as problems. Uh, we see bad people as problems, but yet the Lord calls us to look upon them with compassion because they are like sheep without a shepherd. Unbelievers are blinded by the God of this world, the Bible says. Unbelievers will do what unbelievers do because they're unbelievers. And the only way we can change that to multiply and to be multipliers as Jesus has called us to be is to start with compassion. We need compassion within the body of Christ. Is that not right? We need to be there for others. In fact, there's a very dangerous thing, and Pastor Tony, I know that maybe you can identify with them, is with, with us, and I'll touch on it a bit more specifically later, that people think because I have, a, and I know I've mentioned this before, a smorgasbord of many apostles, prophets, and teachers that I can access online, that I don't need to come to church that I can just stay away. I'm not talking if you've got to work or there's a legitimate or you're taking a holiday. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about compassion. And if I have a kaleidoscope of colorful peakers, in, in fact, they boast, and you know, I know this one and I'm of this one and I'm of that one, just like the Corinthians. And they think that that is some sort of spirituality. And I want to say this morning very clearly that is a great deception. Now, we all can glean from others and have others' input into our lives, and there are many good Bible teachers. I'm not saying that there aren't. But I can tell you there's a false sense of spirituality where there is no compassion, where I'm just worried about me and mine, and I'm not looking out on the things. I'm not available for others. Jesus said true spirituality, true Christianity is we need to die to ourselves. We need to pick up our cross. We need to follow him. We need to love others and give our lives for others as he did. Is that not right? Other things that appear to be spirituality are but illusions. They're self-deception. And let us, I, I just want to know, maybe sometimes there's even less people when I speak these messages, but I have a mandate to speak the word of God. Compassion. Jesus didn't only have passion for his own things. He wasn't only zealous about his own house. He had compassion on the multitudes out there in here. We need to have compassion. Secondly, we see. He didn't call a prayer meeting. <laughs> he didn't uh, begin to have seven days, and that's got its place of, of prayer and fasting. But the Bible says when he saw the great multitudes... He began to teach them. He began to teach them. You see, before you can call the multitudes to pray, you need to teach them. And I saw a poster once, I know when I was still, we were still using the youth, and I put it up in our youth hall, and it had a big eye. And it had people, and it had the caption there that you are the only Bible that most people will ever see. You're the only Bible that most people will ever see. In our workplaces, where we stay, 
in the road on our by and by, we need to be able to encourage people. We need to be able to teach them. If I go back to my, uh, I don't like using the word secular. You know, they call it secular work and full-time ministry. I believe that everyone <laughs> is called to full-time ministry in different capacities. But I know in the corporate world and many years I worked in a factory and the engineering office and so forth. And I had to teach people. I had to teach unbelievers because obviously there are many philosophies, there's many ideas, there's many things and, uh, and, and misconceptions in the world. But you have to use those opportunities to teach people. And it says that Jesus began to teach them many things. He obviously began to teach them the truth. He began to teach them about God. He began to teach them about salvation. We don't know all the many things, but he taught them many, many things, even before he fed them. He taught them many things, our testimony. I am the only Bible. You are the only Bible that some people will ever, ever see. Not everyone's just going to pitch up here on a Sunday or elsewhere and to go to church. They need to see. We need to teach them. We need to show them. We need to tell them that Jesus has died for them and that God wants to save them and give them eternal life. Jesus said we are the salt. We are the light of the world. We need to have that compassion that multitudes are dying in their sin. They're destined for hell unless we intervene. Thirdly, this morning is faith. I'm asking what are some of the essential, and I've made six of you here, what are some of the essential qualities or ingredients for us to multiply? Because that's what we're called to do. We, we are called to be fruitful. We are called to multiply. And the Bible always takes us back to, and I don't know, that is a good thing. That is an exciting thing, that, that we are created to have dominion of all the works that God has made. And we are called to be fruitful. We're called to, to multiply, but it takes faith. And uh, listen, um, this was a deserted place, the Bible says. Uh, all the supermarkets were closed. <laughs> There's no place to buy food. They were actually very far from in the natural, it seemed a, an impossible situation uh, to feed them. <laughs> and immediately the disciples, like us, started calculating and trying to work this thing out logically, uh, try to weigh the numbers and, and estimate the crowd and uh, how they would get food and how much, uh, how much it would take <laughs> Uh, to feed this multitude. Uh, in another gospel, one of the other, it says Jesus already knew what he was going to do, but he said this to test them. He said to them to see how they will react because Jesus calls us not to walk by sight. And friend, family of God, if we want to multiply, we have to do it by faith. I know one of the challenges, and I know uh, uh, Linda and Tony will know very well that um, we are building an extra classroom at the back and, and uh, a youth center over here. And we actually didn't have money to do it. Um, uh, we didn't have the money all laid out. And we, as a council, discussed and said, yes, look, we can borrow, but let's not do it that way. Let us believe God. Uh, it goes against good economics. <laughs> And I'll attempt to that in a moment. It goes against logic. But the Bible calls us to call those things. Faith calls those things that are not as though they were. I'm not talking about presumption, but we can act in the mandate of God's word. If we are in ministry, and we are, all of us are in ministry, we can act out in faith and begin to call those things that are not as though they are. Mark eleven twenty four. Jesus said, Whosoever or whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And this was the level that God is taking us to and wants us to walk in more and more, especially during these difficult times. Uh, we had the regional overseer here, and as we dedicated the project a few weeks back, and uh, one of the things he said, he said we, he commends us as a church. We're not a big church, but he commends us 
that during these tough economic times, <laughs> where there's inflation and where there's all sorts of issues and problems, that you have endeavored to take that step of faith and bold and go forward with the kingdom. Why? Because we are called to multiply. It's not a good thing to have a maintenance ministry, and I know we do need to maintain, we do need to feed the sheep, we do need to care for the sheep, uh, but we cannot get into maintenance mode. We need to go forward. And we've got a problem in a school. We've got shortage of space. And so that's a good thing. It's a needful thing. Faith is the belief, the boldness, the confidence, the audacity to call those things that are not as though they were. And I want to encourage us, let us have an audacious faith. Let us not be overcome by the challenges we're facing and just say, thank you, Lord, that I'm made in your image. And thank you, Lord, that you've called me to be fruitful, to multiply, to impact my family, my environment, my workplace, to multiply for you. Can you say amen to that? Praise the Lord. It focuses on what is not yet seen Faith believes in the supernatural power of God to accomplish the task, not the facts or the cold logic or economic hardship or scarcity. They only had a few loaves. There was nothing. They didn't have any food. They didn't take any preparations with them. But Jesus was showing them something. Jesus is showing us something today. Exactly the same things. I've made the comment, as image bearers of Christ, our creator, we by faith can also create something out of nothing. We can create possibilities out of impossible situations, believe. We need compassion. We need discipleship. We need faith. And fourthly this morning, we need order. We need order. Notice Jesus didn't, this wasn't a haphazard thing. He said, listen, uh, command the people. Uh, you know, Jesus, when he speaks to us, he doesn't say, well, if you feel like it, if it's convenient, if you can, and if you've got the time, you know, can you please? No. Uh, <laughs> he commands. He commands us to make disciples of all nations. He commands us to love one another. It's not optional. A disciple will obey those commands. But there's a divine order, God's divine order. In other words, it says in Corinthians that God is not a God, or God is a God of order, not of confusion. He says to the disciples, first, make them. Make them sit down in hundreds. Uh, make them sit down in, in fifties on, on the grass and Get this thing sorted out first. This is very important for us to recognize if we're talking about how can I be a multiplier? How to become fruitful? Listen, get your house in order first. God has a divine order for the family. Immediately proceeding to the creation, it said God made them male and female. I just want to tell you the spirit of antichrist, the spirit of wickedness, in the world today, wants to try and change God's divine order for the family. He made them male and female, and we can have all the gender change and operations we want to. That's never going to change. Not to mention that there's going to be no offspring. <laughs> okay, so people are so foolish sometimes, but we need to change it. We need to teach them these things, and we need to stand boldly to do that. But God is an order for the family. The husband is the head of the home. The wife is his helpmate. They are heirs together of life, the Bible says. There are ways to respect one another, to love one another, to honor one another. Children are called to be in subjection to the parents. The parents are to nurture and to admonish and teach and train the children in the ways of God as an order. It's not a confusing thing. God has a very, very particular order. And if we want to multiply, if we want to be fruitful, we have to walk according to his order for our homes, for our workplaces. God has an order for the church. He gave some to be apostles. He gave some to be prophets. 
He gave some to be evangelists and pastors and teachers, God's order, for the equipping of the saints for works of ministry. To perfect the saints, to nurture them, to mature them, that we be no longer blown around by every wind of doctrine. You know, in many times and too often today we say, well, let's be used on the payroll, give him a dog collar, and you do the ministry and we sit in and receive. That's not God's divine order. God has given specific gifts for the equipping of the saints. And if you carry on, and it says the whole body, when, as we grow and become mature, joined to the head, causes the growth of the body for the glory of God. As each member does the work, as each member ministers and, and, and serves one another in love. That causes the growth of the body. If we miss God's divine order for the body, guess what? We cannot grow. We cannot multiply. We cannot become fruitful. God's divine order. Finances. I know you speak to many pastors and uh, I counsel and many times the issue is debts, problems, I haven't got enough money and as a church, we, we, we do minister and we can to a certain extent. Uh, but you know, you, you can give people fish and fish and fish, but they, they need to learn to fish. And the way we do that is God has an order for finance in the kingdom. Now, I'm not a prosperity preacher, but God's order is that the first part, the first tenth is mine. You want to be blessed in your finances? You want an abundance? You want to, the devourer to be rebuked in your home and over your finances? Then give to God what is God's. Give to Caesar what is Caesar. Don't slip on your text. <laughs> but give to God first what is God's. That's the divine order. That is the biblical principle, if you like. And without fail, everyone I see who's in poverty, I'm talking about it as a way of life, not hitting the odd problem here and there, which we all have, you'll find, if you ask, is that they don't tithe. They are poor givers. And therefore, they've got into the cycle of poverty where the debts continue to mount and the resources continue to diminish I'm not saying this because I want a collection here. It's God's. It's for ministry. I'm saying this. I'm speaking about order. If we want to multiply in our personal situations, then order, honor God. Honor God with your increase, with all your increase. I even tell people who uh, have got, seem to have nothing. Now tell me, I only get a government pension. I'll say, do you tithe on your pension? No, no, I need to pay my debts. And it's amazing how difficult it is. I don't know if you've experienced it, Pastor Tony, how difficult to change that mindset when you've been in that your whole life. And I say, well, just try it. You know, if you're getting 100 rand, give 10 rand. And just begin to walk in that and God will, yes, we can help you and we do. We give you a, a, a parcel of groceries here and there. But begin to walk in God's divine spiritual uh, and material order. He has given line up with God's order, uh, I've said, of here. Only at this point, and the next thing Jesus said, so it's compassion, uh, discipleship, faith, God's divine order. Order. Walk into God's, God's divine order for things. Whether it's a church, your family, your personal finances, bringing up your children, husband and wife, whatever it is. Fifthly, this morning is prayer. Prayer. Notice that they, uh, you know, God does this. Um, and uh, my previous point I meant to say is that uh, sometimes we think it can be harsh, you know, that poor widow. But the Bible tells a story of a widow who gave a mite or two mites. And Jesus said she gave everything she had by faith. She was a sower. I have no doubt that God undertook for her. I have no doubt. And we see that in the Bible over and over. We know with Elijah, told the widow, you know, feed me first. 
Hmm. You're teaching them that principle. Feed me first and then go make some food for your son. It's, it seems opposite. Prayer, and that brings me to my next uh, point or quality we need to multiply this morning, is that God multiplies the little that we do have. And many times we don't think we have much to offer. But Jesus knew better. He said, first go and see what you do have. You can't say there's nothing over here. Go see what you do have. Go see what gifts there are among you. And go see what there is. It might not be a lot, but go and discover that first. And we too need to discover. And we need to seek God's face and ask the Lord to help us to discover what we do have. Because God has given to everyone a gift. If we read that passage in 7 before Ephesians 4 that I quoted a little earlier and from 11 to 16, it said, God by his grace has given us everyone, each one of us a gift. All of us have something to offer. My gift is different to yours. Yours is different to the person next to you. But God uses all of that to multiply, to bless the body to be a witness for him in this earth, to fulfill the great commission. Once we do have, and then only Jesus prays, he gives thanks and he blesses it. God blesses it. And by the way, right in the beginning of creation, uh, before man ever thought of asking a blessing, it says that God made them, he created them, he gave them dominion. He said, be fruitful and multiply. And he said, God blessed them. God blessed them before we'd done anything. Before we could do anything, we already had received God's blessing. If you feel God's blessing is not on your life, receive it today. Receive it and just say, thank you that, Lord, you've given me everything I need for you to bless me, to walk in favor through Christ Jesus. Pray for the multiplication of the little that we do have. I was praying the other day, and uh, I pray this many times, and I, uh, you know, on the one side, and maybe this is a confession, <laughs> but on the church side of things, you know, we seem to struggle, and I appreciate those who, who do come and support the ministry, and we have had a lot of impact, and on the other side, we seem to be overflowing, and God is blessed, and, and God always encourages me. And he said, if you had continued in your job, and as a factory manager, it was my last job before I actually um, went into inverted commas, full-time pastoral ministry. The Lord said to me, would you be able to do what you are now doing? Would you have the opportunity? And there's a very clear no. There's a very clear no. We might not all be big and famous, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Maybe we seem to be small in many respects. That's also a good thing when we're small in our own sights. But God is able to multiply that which we do have. And as we continue in him, he creates in us a bigger capacity to multiply more and more. Finally, this morning is the word servant or servanthood. Servant. Notice who Jesus used to do the multiplication. It was his faithful followers, it was the 12 disciples that he used. They had been prepared, they had sat at the feet of Jesus. They were not perfect yet, they were still growing in the Lord, we know that. But they had been faithful, and I just want to say that God uses those who are faithful, I know we probably know the well-known servant, sermon, fat Christians, faithful, available, teachable servants. They didn't argue with Jesus when they put up a bit of an argument initially and started questioning how we're going to do this, <laughs> uh, feed all these people and do this impossible thing. But yet when Jesus began to teach them and, and said, look, just set them down hundreds and fifties, make them sit on the green grass, have a look at what you've got and begin to feed them. And I'm going to multiply. But he used them. Servants, willing servants, faithful disciples 
have the responsibility to undertake the task of multiplication for Jesus. I like what John Maxwell says. He identifies four stages. Come and see Jesus. You just start by inviting people to see Jesus. Come and follow me. Come and follow Jesus. Come and commit to me. That's a stage where many thought, well, this is no longer such a good idea. (laughs) Commitment stage. Then go and multiply. Go and multiply. Go and make disciples of all nations. And that's part of God's order. But God uses. There's a great principle in Scripture, not only now, but even more importantly, ultimately, in terms of our eternal destination, that he who has been faithful over few things will be made responsible over many things. And then we will see that glorious dominion like we've never seen before. We cannot even begin to fully appreciate it The just shall live by faith. It's interesting, and I want to conclude with this. My time is up. That they had just come back from doing miracles, from casting out devils and so forth, and suddenly had began to uh, try and work this whole thing out. Just like the Galatians, Paul said to him, you know, you started it, and now are going to try and finish in the flesh uh, by doing things in the natural, by trying to uh, keep the law and so forth, the ceremonial law. Let us continue by faith in the Spirit and just say, thank you, Lord, that you've created me to have dominion in Christ, that you have restored my image before you, that I'm justified, that I'm righteous before you, that I bear your image in Christ. And thank you, Lord, whatever area it is, and maybe there are different areas, whether you're listening on the podcast this morning, for those here today, whatever area it is, and just say thank you, Lord, that you've called me to be a multiplier. Let's buy our heads. Father, we thank you this morning for your faithfulness. Thank you, Father, that we don't have to rely on the principles of this world. Lord, to be a multiplier, to be fruitful. And Father, thank you that your word gives us and teaches us, just like you taught them, you are continuing to teach us today many things to bring us and to complete in us until we bear the full image of Christ, your full glory, that you continue to make us and perfect us into your image. We thank you for that today. Father, just speak into the lives of every listener this morning, whatever area it is that, that you may feel there's a lack. And just, I want you to just say and confess and, and think about and listen to again, if need be, the word of the Lord and just stand by faith and say, thank you, Lord, that it does not depend on other things or the resources of this world, that my life, my walk is dependent on faith. Because, Lord, you are sovereign. And, Father, I just speak your sovereignty over every situation, over every lack. But, Father, may we as your people walk in compassion. May we be teachers of the gospel, the light, the salt of those around us, inside and outside. Father, may we walk by faith. Father, may we do it according to your divine order of things. Father, may we remain prayerful and to discover what you want us to do and the gifts we have if we don't yet know them. Father, may we just continue in you. And we thank you for this. We pray for your multiplication now. We pray for your blessing over each one now. We give you thanks and we give you praise for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you so much today uh, for listening. For being with us, we're not done yet. Um, I just want to give out a few certificates, um, if you don't mind. We have recently finished.